Open University. Well, my little garotos. Uh, garoto is the Portuguese word for a kid, but it's also a tiny little cappuccino you have in an espresso cup. I'm standing here a bit like Jonathan Meads in front of the uh, Padrol dos Descobrimentos. I found that if you pronounce Portuguese in the kind of Sean Connery voice, uh, you actually get it very accurate. Uh, like instead of saying Lisbon, you say Lisbon, like you're talking about Leith in Edinburgh. And it sounds, you know, in his accent, it sounds actually quite good. So I'm um, standing in front of a thing called the Monument to the Discoveries, which... Um, it was built for the Portuguese World Fair in 1940 under the auspices of uh, Salazar, the fascist dictator, and it's standing on the north bank of the Tagus River at Belém, which is a suburb, really, of, of Lisbon. Uh, but actually, <laughs> uh, I feel more at home inside, so I'm going up to the Ethnographic Museum to do the rest of this video. Um, and um, I'm going to show you slides of um, the area I'm staying in, which is called Moreria. Um, and it is. it was historically the Moorish area. This is the Moreria commercial center you're seeing on the left-hand side, and it's um, Chinese uh, and Indian-dominated clothing, mostly wholesale clothing um, center, just off the, in a Piranesi kind of way, it's just off the, um, um, uh, one of the, uh, the metro stations there. Lisbon um, gets six million people a year as tourists and actually there's a very good um, documentary about the gentrification and the touristification of Lisbon. It's called You'll Soon Be Here. It's a 37 minute documentary by Fabio Petronilli and it's on Vimeo. Um, and I want to take you back just the last couple of days of my photo shooting and I'm going out sort of looking at uniform shops and things. A couple of days ago I bought some um, walking shoes, because <clears throat> I was getting a bit a bit worried about what would happen with my slippery flip-flops in the rain. Um, and I climbed up to the Castello São Jorge, which, again, Salazar, the fascist dictator, kind of renovated. So he's responsible for um, the look of that, looking into bookshops and things on the way. Um, and um, I keep thinking to myself, God, they really, you know, these Lisbon people, they really got their city right, their capital they got it right, and and in a way they're suffering a little bit from its beauty and its allure because of all the tourists coming. Um, these are uh, Portuguese guitars, and um, this is the sort of touristy um, changing of the guard ceremony. This is a um, an avant-garde poetry book in um, the centre of town. So sort of modernist tiles. I find modernist tiles interesting. The idea that they're updating their traditions, but like. Salazar was doing with the castle, the fortress. Um, yeah, I'm just constantly thrilled by the um, <laughs> the usual touristy things, the funicular railway, the, the seven hills like Rome that it's built on, and um, just the, the, the general charm of the city. So um, one of the things I was finding out about in the, uh, the bookshops in the center of town was Saudade, the... Um, Basically, it's a state of mind that your uh, the Portuguese f are in when they're kind of so sap so happy that they become sad. I almost said so sappy that they become sad. Um, but um, it, I found a book in a rather chic little bookshop which had a definition on the cover in French of saudade, and I'm going to translate it for you. Before being thought, it said saudade must be sung before becoming a myth whose contours must be decrypted and before its hagiographic role, Saudade is nothing other than the expression of an excess of love towards everything which deserves to be loved. The absent friend, the jewel box of lovers, nature with her immemorial voice, the murmur of leaves or the waves of the sea. No tragic resonance pierces these songs in which Saudade presents itself in all its naivete. In its Celtic cradle, which is Galicia and the north of Portugal, Saudade seems modified by the universal rhythm of the sea. This Celtic connection is kind of interesting. I wonder if I am responding so positively to this place because precisely I'm a Celt. Um, the fortress, the very first uh, fortress on the top of the where the Castello now is, was a Celtic um, 
fortress, sort of, you know, 2,000 years ago. And the Celts um, migrated from Portugal and Spain through northern France, north northwestern France, to, um, to Scotland and Wales and Ireland. So we may all be connected somehow. What I'm struck by, though, is how close you are to um, Africa here. The light has a particular quality, which I've only really seen anything like in New York. Um, actually, you're, um, you're a bit further south than New York here. The latitude of New York is 40.7 north, and Lisbon is 38.7 north. So you're just a couple of degrees um, further south here, but very similar. You're um, almost the same distance from Casablanca as you are from Madrid. So um, you really are close to Africa. And um, this is the uh, some photos of the top of the, um, the fortress at the Castello. And uh, I really like the, uh, the atmosphere up there, the pine trees and things, um, the sound of the wind and the pines. So I sat there and bought a, a second-hand uh, a French Peyo book about uh, ancient Oriental art. So I was reading about the strange cosmological significance of um, sort of uh, deer and um, various um, sacred animals for these people who lived thousands of years ago. That was a really pleasant way to spend the morning. And uh, I'm, I'm getting used to um, drinking these little sharpening uh, espressos of wherever I go. I don't usually drink espresso, but um, it is kind of the closest coffee comes to a drug where you just take it, you almost inject an espresso and it, it sharpens you. Um, yeah, I'm learning a lot. Each day I'm, I'm, my ignorance is um, disappearing a little bit more. Um, I went um, yesterday to the... Uh, there's so many museums and they're all empty. That's the amazing thing. All these six million tourists a year... Uh, are not going to the museum. So I went to the, um, the Saudad, the Fado Museum, Fado being a kind of melancholy guitar form of song. I was going to go to the Tile Museum, but I kind of didn't make it that far. Um, but I did find this museum of um, the Nobel Prize winning Portuguese author, José Saramago. And um, that's a really amazing um building, it's, a sort of, it's got a, a, a Moorish style front. Uh, Moravia, by the way, is named after the Moors because they were sort of given an area, an immigrant, I guess an immigrant area, after the um, retaking, uh, the Reconquista, as it's called in Spain, from the Muslims, they were kind of ghettoized almost in this area, which remains to this day the immigrant area in Lisbon, and it's on the, the shady side of the Castello Hill. And that's, that's where I'm staying with the Chinese and the, and the um, Bangladeshis. But, uh, yeah, the, um, the museum of uh, José Saramago is um, kind of 80s style inside. They've refurbished the inside of it. And it's sort of amazing postmodern architecture. And this is kind of very touching museum, because Saramago, um, he died in 2010, uh, 12 years after receiving the Nobel Prize for Literature. He... Uh, there was a film I was watching in there where he, he says that, um, you know, fame is, you know, it's all fine. Although it seems in the, in the documentary to, to involve just flying about endlessly in terribly tiring ways, signing autographs, signing books, being mm. photographed, um, and being generally um, just clapped out. And he, he wishes to be a tree in his next life and put down roots somewhere. But mostly he just wants more time. And um, that's the one thing he can't have. So, um, yeah, I was very um, touched by his relationship with his wife, Pilar. They really loved each other, and she, she seems quite a bit younger than him. Uh, she's still alive, of course, but he's gone. So, Portu Portugal, uh, I, I didn't know about this guy. Um, I, I haven't read any of his books. The, the last one he wrote was about an elephant. <laughs> That looked like maybe the most approachable one. Then I, after that, I went to the Fado Museum, and um, I was really surprised to, to see that what we call the Spanish guitar, they call the English guitar. And, it, and there's a little sign saying the English guitar was introduced in Portugal through the English uh, colonies of Lisbon and de Porto, mainly to accompany more educated musical pieces. The first reference to the Portuguese guitar 
as appears at the beginning of the 20th century. So it's a bit like the situation where they, the French call the, the French horn the cor anglais, or they call the, uh, the French letter, or condom, they call it the uh, capote anglais. Everyone sort of um, calls it the, uh, the opposite. So, yeah, they call it the English guitar. So that um, this fado music is played on an English guitar. The most interesting thing I found in there was some cameras built by Carlos Saura. He, he was a fado singer who also built cameras, like, gave them names like the Saura Cam or the Anna Cam. Uh, and um, all those museums are right next to some huge uh, liners, the, the main train station and also the docking area for these fast passenger liners, which are a bit like in Venice, they're debarking thousands of uh, passengers. So it gets pretty hectic down there. There's a lot of crowds, a lot of people blocking the pavements and things. Um, I saw these nice um, old books, Pier Paolo Pasolini and Reina Maria Rilke, in a bookshop which is actually moving across the street. But um, And also these uh, posters of, sort of portraits of caricatures of people which are stuck up on the pillars uh, around the main square and the uh, Moraria area. Um, and in the evening of that day, uh, which was yesterday basically, I went to MAT, M -A, -A, a T, which is a, a big museum down on the Tagus, again at Belem, uh, and that's an amazing place. Um, there was a concert by Antonio Caramello, who's actually organized my gallery event later in the month, um, uh, next Friday actually, and uh, he was playing kind of dr ambient drone music in this very flying saucer shaped museum and um, performing by um, sort of projecting Super 8 films on the walls. So uh, again I was thinking wow because just uh, I came out as dusk was falling and I was just thinking they've really got this place right. I mean it's, it seems to have all the best elements of all the best cities in the world pasted together, cut and pasted together. Um, and the, the nicest, um, and there's an exhibition of videos in there in the gallery section of it. The best one in there was one I'd already seen actually from a few years ago, Melanie Gilligan's Crisis in the Credit System, which turns a kind of, turns the, the 2008 uh, crash into a, a kind of uh, management training creativity uh, brainstorming session with uh, funny little soap opera elements and, and, and songs. Um, then this morning, the first thing I did was find a copy of uh, Saint-Exupéry's book about flying to Africa. And he, a bit like me, I came over the um, the Dolomites and got some turbulence and he said that the, the pilots of the postal service in the early days were, were terrified of those mountains, uh, often died or went down in those mountains. Mm -hmm. Saint Exupéry's book um, has this nice little passage in it. I no longer understand the people on suburban trains, he writes. These men who think they're men, but who actually are reduced by a pressure they barely feel, like ants to whatever uses are made of them. What do they fill themselves up with when they're free on their absurd little Sundays? So immediately after I bought this French book, I went to the French Institute, which is actually very close to the puppet museum where I was last week. Uh, that area seems to be the sort of the gentrifying area, Puppet Museum, French Institute. So I hung out there using the Wi-Fi and um, uh, took photographs of a Michel Leris diary of his China visit in the late 50s. He went to China. You had to change, you had to, if you took a plane to China from France at that time, you basically had to take 20 separate flights, uh, keep landing every day or several times a day you would land in these weird places on the way. So he, he notes all this down fairly um, scrupulously. The other thing I was doing as I was walking around was just looking into Chinese shops, because I'm always fascinated by what they have in these Chinese shops and how they're different in each country. Um, and um, so I, I walked all the way to Belém, basically, where I wanted to see the uh, popular art museum. It's basically a folk art museum which is now connected to the ethnographic museum. And um, but, but checking, um, I stopped for lunch in a, a kind of working man's cafe and had 
actually some really nice simple food and um, walked over various of the seven hills and um, yeah when I got down to the um, the folk museum there were as usual lots of people outside but absolutely nobody inside I mean there were there were literally three people in the whole museum while I was there these museums are ridiculously cheap too it was two two euros fifty to get in but still they couldn't fill it and it actually had this really interesting socialistic um, kind of um, language on the uh, the curatorial boards um, uh, and actually there's a socialist government in power here in Portugal one one of the signs said modernity of the magazine there was actually a really good exhibition in there about how the tiles, how the illustrations on tiles are actually um, often taken from photographs and tiles are you'd think of them as predating photography but actually they come after so there was this sign that said, Modernity of the magazines, uh, illustrated magazines proliferated in the 19th and 20th centuries in Portugal, uh, providing the motifs for some of the tiles. So photographs in these magazines would be turned into tiles. A new story appearing in the press is associated with the idea of truth if it's accompanied by a photograph. Uh, this is something that could easily be transferred to the contents of tiles copied from it. In this sense, the archetypal image of the country is used to show and also create an image for Portugal, an image produced by a certain social group, i.e. the bourgeoisie, with an extremely strong presence in these magazines. <laughs> I like I like that, i.e. the bourgeoisie. I kind of couldn't really imagine reading that in a British museum. So then after seeing this um, Portuguese folk museum, I went up the hill to the ethnographic museum, which is even more enormous and even more empty. Um, just the permanent collection on display and there was nowhere, no one in there and that's why I'm pacing up and down actually filming this right now in the um, in the corridors of the Ethnographic Museum right next to the coffee machine uh, because it was so empty I could have, you know, I could have taken off my clothes and walked naked and there would have been nobody to see me. So um, back to puppets and shadow play and stuff like that. All the stuff that I love. I was kind of confused by Franklin Villas Boas who I th mixed up with Franz Boas, who was also an anthropologist, but this Franklin Boas was a Portuguese anthropologist, whereas Franz Boas was American-German, mixed American-German. So this was actually a really cool museum, and again, it was like three euros to get in. And they had these dusty old anthropological books in the, the bookshop. And... Um, I kind of feel at home with anthropology and uh, I was sort of trying to imagine Theresa May endorsing um, anthropology or ethnography. It seems deeply unfashionable in the sort of ethnocentric and uh, xenophobic times we live in to look in this kind of relativistic, value-neutral way at other, other ways of living. And uh, I'm going back outside to finish this. And uh, uh, I just wanted to tell you that I got compared. I was very happy because I, I went to this market and got compared to Camoeth, who is the um, <laughs> the national poet of Portugal. And um, I usually get, uh, if people shout things at me, they shout Jack Sparrow, who apparently is a character in the Pirates of the Caribbean, not that I've seen that. Or people just say Pirata, Pirate. Or once I got called David Bowie in Osaka, which kind of I liked, obviously. In Israel, I got uh, people shouted Moshe Dayan, whose eye patch was actually um, offered for sale on eBay in 2005 with a starting bid of $75,000. So perhaps uh, perhaps that's a bit of a gold mine for me, maybe a bit later. Um, I've never been compared to Lafcadio Hearn, who's the Japanese, um, the Japan Japanologist with just one eye, but perhaps that's because he didn't wear an eye patch. And the thing to know about um, Camoes is that his great work, the uh, Lucias, is actually an account of Vasco da Gama's voyage to India, his discovery of a, a nautical passage to India. So that takes us full circle back to this uh, monument behind me, monument to the discoveries. Open University.